Hey, Louisa. How are you? Can hey. you hear me? I'm here now, yeah. How's, how's life with you? Not bad. Not bad, so, yeah. Considering. I know. It's, it's, it's a bit of a strange situation, isn't it? Very. Um, yeah. Unprecedented. <laughs> I know. It, it really is. But to be honest, no, no one could have foreseen this, but, you know, like, but like a virus having this kind of effect on 2020, really. I know. I mean, I guess we should have probably taken more notes of it when, when we probably first heard about it back in like February, March time, maybe. Definitely. I don't think, yeah, I don't think any of us thought it, but maybe the people in charge should have, <laughs> should have definitely probably. more notice. Yeah. But I mean, how have you been anyway? Because it's been, it's been quite a while since the last time I really said hello to you. Actually, face yeah. to face. I think yeah. the, last time, the last time I would have seen you probably was the bath gig at the Comedia. Oh, yeah. In, in that front bar area. Yeah, that was a while. Yeah. That was, that, that was better. Like, it was it was a really great show. But I mean, I remember that night, so I slightly freaked out someone because I was air drumming and like just <laughs> caught out. And so, like, I was, I was like unintentionally making someone feel quite, quite anxious. Yeah, it was it was a small uh, gig, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it was yeah. nice. Uh, yeah, I remember coming over because it was like because of you playing. Was it Bristol the night afterwards? But it, there were so many gig clashes on that night. Though, like, right, okay, I'm going to come and see you play in Bath. Yeah. Instead, <laughs> because of like, you know, it's only just like ten minute train ride sort of thing. Yeah, I didn't realise they were actually that close, and that's the yeah. first, it's the only time I've been to Bath, it was really nice. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a weird town, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's not often a town which I really could have go to for shows, because we do get so spoiled in Bristol. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, it's, it's definitely, like, I'm definitely felt it with the, like the loss of shows how it's really changed kind of things and places really yeah we I, like i always see like you on twitter saying i just don't know which show to go to because you've got like you've got so many options in bristol yeah we and we, 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 we've been lucky to have that i mean i'm actually not in bristol at the moment i'm actually in plymouth okay right now because i've decided that when they announced the second lockdown i was like right okay so i've survived the first one just about on my own yeah. This one, I'm coming down to family, so I'm yep. actually in my parents' flat right now. Oh, cool. So has that been better for you? Yeah. So it's, it means that I've been to like surrounded with people. Yeah. And that it's taken away some of the some of the social anxiety edge, which definitely kind yeah. of cropped up a lot with the with the first isolation because of um, living on my own flat, sort of thing. Yeah um that's literally isolation isn't it yeah it literally is i mean like the thing is it's, it's where it's like it's fine when you choose to live on your own but when you're enforced yeah on your own it's very different yeah i mean how have you been coping with the lockdown life situation i've been lucky because um we've i've got a nice I've got a nice house um to live in with with family and um I got a nice garden and so when it was like when the first lockdown happened it wasn't it wasn't so bad I feel bad for people who who were in dodgy living situations and mm. have been forced to I don't know there's, there's a lot of people obviously it's been harsher on a lot of people depending on where you live and who you live with and, yeah. and, how, and how much you've got to avoid normal life is what like if you've got to like shield or stuff like that. Yeah. So well, there's been varying degrees of harshness on people. And for me, I feel really lucky. I've got like a music room as well. You we can like change the garage into a music room. So I've still been cool. able to like be creative and make demos and, you know, carry on doing stuff. Yeah. So I was going to actually ask you about how do you go around like to the songwriting? Do you have like a special one that you kind of go into to work sort of thing? Like zipping is there like one specific space that you've got to be in, right? When you're gonna like approach a song, sort of thing. Um, not I said now nowadays it's more like I used to just like write around the house with my guitar, mm. and like I'd, I'd, I'd 
probably most of like the first album was written like sitting on the toilet in the old house <laughs> in because the reverb was really nice in the bathroom so I'd just sit there with my guitar and write yeah um but then um in the, the new place where we're living now there's not enough room to get in there with your guitar on the toilet so that's just like <laughs> ended that whole yeah. scenario but um I think more like I'm more just like go into the music room and like go and, and tend to write something now and like yeah. s- start with like start with a beat or start with a bass line or you know start things a bit differently instead of just me sitting with an acoustic guitar. Do you ever find that you have to like kind of improvise with a lot of your words because of like there's quite a lot of like especially on the first record um, there's quite a lot there's definitely like kind of like heavy beat poetry sort of influence in mm. there. And um, I was just wondering, do you, is there ever point where you, where you can get lost and you just like find yourself having to like Im- improvise your way out of things? Um, yeah, like I think some, some of it, I think it just comes in all kinds of different ways. I don't think there's any like one set way. I've got like whole songs there which I've written the whole song but I haven't got any words for it it's all like kind of mumbled because yeah I can feel like the melody coming or whatever but I don't know what the word on I've got to sit down and kind of work out what the words should be or could be and then other stuff's just like right I need to write a poem about this subject and then I'll, I'll start off writing the words and then it'll evolve into a song so you're fine. just staying open to like whatever kind of Thing happens and not having one set process. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that, that that that's definitely something which which I found. So I tried to write poetry and stuff, but yeah. usually what I find, I don't know if you do this, but I usually come up with the hook first. So right. I'm usually like, so if I if I'm like kind of like so coming up with with, with words, it's almost like so coming up with the chorus first, and then you just have to like um kind of free think about that really. Yeah. I think it's good if you can come up with the chorus first, because um, you know that's your that's your key thing, isn't it? Really, so you can. It's like, it's, 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 sorry, it's, it's, sorry for sorry for interrupting, but it's a bit like kind of writing a punchline for a joke. Yeah, yeah. You kind of got to, It's almost like you're kind of working it backwards. You go right. Here's the punchline. What's the build up going to be? Yeah, we can. I think I think you can you can equally do it either way as well you can you can have great verses and but then you've got to get a, a chorus that it's good enough to match it to get, yeah. you know, take it to another another place where you know so it's not just all a bit too versy <laughs> yeah i'll go another voice otherwise to be honest we'll just still just ramble mumble over everything to be honest wouldn't, wouldn't you probably <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um yeah so i've been I've been, yeah, I'm trying to write poems as well. I think it's just always good, or just like using, just using words, just working mm. with words is like all, all chips in to help. I mean, also one thing which I was going to ask, which is, do you have like a technique for for memorizing things that you've written? Hmm. I think to memorize it is, I think recording it is the is the is the um, main thing that helps to keep it in your memory because because you just end up going over it so many times mm. that it just kind of sticks in there. Um, yeah, it's, uh, apart from that, the only the only technique that anyone's ever said about for remembering, memorizing stuff is kind mm. of like visualizing a story while you're saying it. Yeah, or visualizing, visualizing the things that are in. The words, if you can, if you can make like a visual story out, out of them things, then that can help you. Yeah, I definitely feel that. But I mean, like I, I mean, the reason why I kind of ask that is because I used to have, not many people have ever heard this, but I used to have like a kind of alternative industrial rap outfit called yeah. Manica. So I used to be like kind of a rapper myself. So I mean, I, and I created like these really dodgy kind of backing tracks on my dad's computer like in the early 2000s and it was all it was all basically about stuff which i'd personally been through yeah um, but every single time i did it live i had to add loads of the words yeah like, I, I couldn't either remember entirely and everything that i'd written 
but also B, it was like emotionally it had to flow a little bit differently. Mm. But I'd always, um, so I always knew, so I always had that thing of like visualizing what the words would look like and what they would kind of, and I knew the narrative that I was telling. Yeah. But it's always slightly different every time. Oh, that's really cool. See, that's yeah. proper like freestyling, really, isn't it? Yeah. I can't really um, freestyle. I mean, that probably would be quite a good exercise to try and get into freestyling, like just, just. I think that probably help with other stuff, like. But mm. um, I think would you, I'd say freestyles would probably have like a notebook where they've got like loads of things that they'll fall back on, but it'll always be a little bit different every time. Yeah, with me, it's it's very much whatever energy I'm feeling. Mm. So the the, I mean, like. Um, I mean, I always used to kind of, kind of like be on stage in black and white face paint and like kind of, this is back when I used to have no hair, so I used to be like kind of shaven headed. I used to wear like, wear like this giant orange, this like kind of old school uniform and like kind of and like uh, the bottle of tomato ketchup. So I was like trying to be like, so I was, I was trying to be like kind of like drugging and swigging and like trying to be like fake blood sort of things. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I, I think I managed to scare off one of Sony's A and R men in about ten <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, because like back when I was at music college in in Bristol, he came down. They 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 supposedly sent someone down because we had like had a quite a big college down there. Yeah. With access to music, and I think he lasted about ten seconds <laughs> of me. Cause, but mind you, I did two songs. It's like the first one, and they were all like really nasty backing tracks that we created so the first one was like an experimentation in between me and my friend jake and like a four track and like lots of distorted noises and it literally sounded like as as one of our one of our cheaters described it's like being taken to the gallows <laughs> <laughs> what was the, what was your genre what, what did you I, I i called it like kind of bleak hop because it was like kind of i was very influenced by I guess alternative hip hop, so like dialect and like kind of Saul Williams and that sort of thing. Mm. Yada yada. Um, and I still am kind of heavily influenced by all those people, really. Um, but yeah, I called it Bleak Hop. Yeah. So like, what's that? What's their vibe then? What's the? What's that kind of part of hip hop that you? That um. You're... I guess that's, I liked it for the fact that they still had like the slightly public enemy being bappy to feel, but then also like lots of noise. Yeah. They were doing actually kind of something quite interesting. Yeah. And also telling a narrative. Yeah. I, I like, those... feel like, feel like public enemy kind of like the energy that the hip hop was like bringing then, and it was like, you know, actually fight the power. Yeah. Stuff. And like actually like giving a message and 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 cutting through to say you know yeah. like, to make change yeah and definitely it somehow kind of got lost the message kind of got like swallowed up by capitalism a bit and like you don't you don't really get that kind of like raw hip-hop thing anymore well you kind of i think you do but it's a very different way yeah here's of like um i mean obviously there's bands like run the jewels yeah. For instance, they've definitely brought that back. And then um Kendrick as well, doesn't he? Kendrick Lamar, you know, yeah. Kendrick Lamar's a great rapper. Um but also was so like looking at obviously stuff like Death Grips as well, where they were just like, right, okay, we're gonna be basically as punk as punk by basically um creating as much noise as possible. Yeah. Um but also say for me, like that's the reason why I got into like I accidentally stumbled into dialect about 17 years ago because I was literally down at my grand's flat and I was a bit like bored out of my skull going like oh like let's go down to let's see if there's any gigs on yeah and literally kind of stumbling into them and going like oh my fuck this is what would happen if you mixed like kind of public enemy with my bloody valentine and sonic youth <laughs> I was just like yep yeah. <laughs> I remember I remember it was, it, was, it was definitely one of those shows where I couldn't sleep afterwards because I had to listen to the album five times over. Wow. I got that excited. Yeah. Just well into it straight away. Well, yeah. Well, it's, well, it's like, you know, when you hear something which completely blows your mind, sometimes you do get that obsessed. Yeah. 
Like, well, what, have you have you found any have you found any albums like in lockdown that have have been like that for you? Yeah, I've found one or two. There's been there's a band called Ganza who are from Chicago. They're like a kind of excellent kind of co female fronted post punk outfit. And I kind of got a bit obsessed with them. Yeah. Um, there's, there's been one or two things, really. I mean, like, I find myself sometimes, like the other week, I was watching, uh, 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 so I've been obviously watching lots of stream gigs. I yeah. don't know how you how you feel about those kind of shows but I've they seen, definitely I've seen but, a couple yeah I don't, I've watched loads of them but I've seen a couple whereas I mean well, they definitely helped me cause like especially through the first lockdown I was like right I was timing my walk kiss to what was on in the evening yeah sort of thing especially about how seven like six seven o'clock at night sort of thing yeah um because last week I was watching, a, there's a stream from the Korean festival. Yeah. And where well, there's a brilliant band called Jambanai who are on Bella Union Records, who are like a kind of Korean post metal band. Okay. Uh, who are on the lineup, who I already knew. But I fell in love with this really random um, South Korean disco outfit called Lee Nauchi. Oh, cool. Yeah. I kind of like find myself, you know, having to. There's two or three songs from those which I've pretty much been playing solidly for the past week. Cool. Like, there's some really good stuff coming out of uh, Korea, isn't there? Like, interesting. I think, stuff. yeah. Well, I think the thing is, is that I think that there's, that there, that there's always, there's always, a big, I think there's always good stuff coming out of every country. Yeah. Really, it's just whether we tap into it or when, do, when people tap into it, you know. True. Case of like, I mean, like there's stuff coming out of individual cities, yeah. You know, um, and there's stuff like, you know, like I go to Primavera Sound every, um, like every summer, pretty much in Barcelona, and I'm always amazed by, especially like the Polish takeover. Okay. Because every single year, there's always one Polish act which pretty much always blows everything else out to the water. Okay. And it's. It's. I don't know how to put it in words. It's just like, so like this year, last year it was a band called Longacy, who were like a, a Polish kind of psych space jazz outfit. And it, and it was just like, wow, okay, how does someone follow that lot up? <laughs> it was like it was like if if, if Hawkwind took a load of st steroids, come from like to the, the middle of Poland. And like kind of added in, you know, but added in like kind of spacey saxophones. Okay. Interesting. And, yeah, but it's like every year. I mean, yeah. I do like that when um, they have like, we went to, we did um, Zandari Fest in, uh, or Festa, Zandari Festival anyway, and then in, in Seoul in South Korea back wow. in 2016. Wow. And they had like, um, they did like the French night and the English night or the British night and stuff like that. It was good. It was good like when they do the takeover mm. and you get to see like a whole like flavour of what's coming through in that country kind of thing. Yeah. I think that, I think that is important to so kind of like, because sometimes we do get too bogged down with what's happening in, you know, from like musically from like the UK and from America. But, but actually, sometimes some of the more extraordinary stuff is coming from sometimes the most unexpected countries. It's like, kind yeah. of, even stuff like Russia, I mean, like, I guess I'd take things like going to festivals like The Great Escape. Yeah. And um, quite often I'd take punts on just because it would be a band from like a random country. It'd be like, oh, look, here's a band from outer Siberia. He'd <laughs> <laughs> be, be like, kind of like, indie punk sort of thing, or like, here's a band from like, kind of, or be like, so to like, here's someone who does kind of R&B, but like throat singing. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, it's like, randomness, isn't it? Yeah, I think actually sometimes that maybe sometimes like some things that we maybe miss out on, but maybe some of the, some of the bigger festivals maybe. Yeah. 
and like I think like yeah it's it's the live music it's that's the kind of thing that you get from live music isn't it like you wouldn't really you wouldn't come across it just like listening on Spotify or just you know the algorithms that you end up listening to or whatever you, you go to a festival live music and mm. you know, that's where you see all the extraordinary stuff isn't it yeah well I remember like kind of the first time I actually heard throat singing being done live and it was um I was at a, I was at a festival called Beautiful Days. Yeah. And there's an artist called um, Yatka, and he just done a like an album of covers, but of like kind of, but um, he was doing like two Van Deep Throat singing. So he was doing like kind of, and it was freaking amazing because it's him with um, a guy called Albert Cousins. Yeah. And so they did. Um, like kind of Joy Division's Love Will Tear Us Apart, uh, oh. which sounded pretty brilliant. Um, Orgasmatron by Motorhead, which wow. like, yeah, of course, that's, that, that, that would sound pretty brilliant. You know, like um, they did um, Exodus for the People by Bob Marley and the Wailers. Wow. Um, what else did they do? They did I Won the Levy Breaks by Led Zeppelin. Was that like on like a little, like a little stage or...? It was on the big top, so it was like I think there was only two stages at that at that, at that yeah. festival at the time. Yeah. But they were well, on the festival, isn't it? I've, yeah. We played there, and it was like it had like glass and vibes about it. Yeah, I mean it's that's the one which the level is set up. Yeah. As well, so it's like I think I went for the first. I went as a volunteer there for the first two or three years. Because it's like, right, okay, well, if I couldn't afford the ticket, then sometimes I would look yeah. up on websites to see if they were accepting volunteers to work there. Yeah. Um, the crowd was really nice. Everyone was like, just, it was like everyone was all getting on with each other really well. And, you know, just when you're strangers around you, it's just like, you know, you're all in it together and having fun. And yeah. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, like, that's, 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 what, that's what I've really missed this year, is actually, isn't just so much watching the band, but it's everything else, it's like the communities which surround the events. Yeah. Because of like, um, I mean, I've, I've become a regular, like, kind of Green Man Festival, per se. And it's like, right, I miss all the production team, I miss all the, you know, like, all the, all the events people, but then also, like, and all the people which I'd usually see in the crowd. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I like think. We, did, we did once um streamed it gig from Birkenhead. Yeah. Um, which we had a crowd and a live stream. So Oh wow. It was a bit yeah, a bit, I think it's uh, it's actually difficult to do sound for live and a live stream at the same time and get it spot on. But um but yeah, it was great to do the gig and it was just great to be in the venue. Even mm. though it was socially distanced, the crowd were like really great and it was just like walking into the venue and, and like going to the dressing room and yeah. um, and having the crew members like working on the lighting and seeing the stage and it was just like just all the stuff like around it that yeah. was like, made you realise how much you missed gigs and it's the same with me so like in, in Bristol post lockdown we were lucky to have you know a couple of venues did socially distanced gigs and actually, it was it was like kind of going in there, seeing some of the old like lighting engineers, sound techs, but then like it's places like the lanes and like the Trinity Centre Garden, and but then it was and and it was also getting to see the faces which I wouldn't see you know anywhere else but at shows. Yeah. You know. And Just then, like doing inside the, the venue, doing stuff. Yeah. But it's also like as if in, um, for me, it was also like it made me realise, you know, how important they were because of it's like right, okay, all my friends, all my friendships were based around going to shows, mm. which and like um, it'd be the the usual thing of me turning up on my own, not really knowing anyone, then it'd be like kind of five minutes later, be like, oh look, I made friends with some with some people, yeah, sort of thing, yeah. I mean, you played one of my favourite venues as well, which was the Louisiana. Yeah, Louisiana, yeah. That was uh, a great gig. 
I think that was, I think, was that the first time you came to watch us? Yeah. 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 I remember um, some, um, my friend, Arif, was there and he was like, you know, you've got the best gig in town if Jeff's here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't always believe the hype. Don't always, I, I know I said it's a lot, but, but it's, it is a public enemy point. Don't believe the hype. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it was a really nice venue. Yeah, I mean that, that that's that's been a place which have effectively like kind of they 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 pretty much did take me under their wings, sort of thing. So I just turn, so I turn up there sometimes. Um, in fact, actually, the last one of these conversations I did was with Mick, who runs the Louisiana. Oh, cool. And so he he uh, he knew me back from like when I was like shaven headed, really, really socially awkward. Mm. Um but and so he's probably seen he's probably the person that's seen the biggest transformation in me. Mm-hmm. As if in like, you know, like um say we can like go from yeah, I don't know, can I be being kind of uncertain to being this person where they, they've even they've even created a hand stamp after me. That's amazing. So I'm on the Louisiana head hand stamp. Ah. So it's like it's it's they got a local artist to do the conceptual painting of my hair by was just head banging. <laughs> and then they they um so then they put Big Jeff approved. Oh, that's um, nice. Yeah, I know. To be honest, it's not often you get one of your favourite venues like literally making a hand stamp after you. Yeah, that's really cool. It's like I used to have a stone at the fleece. Um, where, where, where they where they named after me. So don't they, have you ever played the fleece in Bristol? The fleece? Oh yeah, we played the fleece last time. Yeah. It was a really nice venue and the sound guy was so great. Yeah. He, I really loved him. Um, he actually made, I, I'd left like a part of me in here, Mike set th- in here, um, you know, when I can listen yeah. to the sound from here. Um, I left like the transmitter bit in the in the venue before, and he like made one for me out of some bits that he found in the in the. Oh, for you, but. So it was like it was it was really clever and really impressive, and like, yes, yeah, just just that nice. Yeah, you know that they've got the poles in the fleece. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it was only a couple of years ago that they expanded the stage outwards, but I used to stand in front of the set in front of the front pole. And I used to like kind of wedge myself in between the pole and the stage. It's is it is for several reasons. It's basically mostly so I could still be down the front and not really be blocking be that much of an eyesore to anyone. Yeah. Just because of like like kind of right being in front of the pole. And also if there's a full on mosh pit kicking up, uh, I'd be like safe from it. <laughs> so, so I'd still be rocking out. Okay, occasionally I'd accidentally, you know, like kind of head bound backwards and like knock myself out almost <laughs> by, by like a head by, by like head banging the poles sort of thing. <laughs> Just getting a bit carried away. Yeah. Oh that that, that, that did happen sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean it did used to be a case, especially when I was younger, when it'd be like, right, okay, it used to be a sign, like a sign of a good show if you came out with bruises. Mm. If you I mean, if you came, if you came out like sweat drenched and like and, and like maybe one or two bruises and it'd be like, yep, you definitely had a good time. Yeah. I mean, would you like always avoid the mosh pit or? I've always, I've never been much of a mosher. I've always been a headbanger and a dancer. Yeah. So I've never been, I, I think it's partly because I'm dyspra- absolutely dyspraxic. Yeah. So um, I find it difficult, um, like regaining my balance mm. sort of thing. Yeah, there's a lot going on, isn't there? Isn't there? Yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on the band because, like, if it's like kind of like a gentle band like Fleet Foxes, you wouldn't exactly expect you know like a full on circle pit to be happening at that show. <laughs> but where, whereas if it's someone like the Bronx or like someone from more like the hardcore backgrounds, and you kind of expect that from the audience. Yeah, but you've got a little pole that you can hide in front of. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, well, I did. I mean, like, it, it was pretty much my, it was, it was pretty much my safety ground. And also, sometimes I get high fived by people because I'd just be down the front. <laughs> nice. I think the most high fives I've received at one show was actually, um, you know, like the hip hop hardcore duo Horror. 
No. Or Hato Nine Nine Oh Nine. No, I don't um, know. They're 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 really good actually. They're one of my one of mine and Meg's favourite ever gigs at the Louisiana, and I spent the entire show because this, this is how lively it got by pretty much clinging onto the PA stack on the side of the wall, because um, the because basically the entire the entire room was like completely bursting into like walls of death and like circle pits, sort of things. <laughs> And it was almost like every other song I was being high fived by, by the rap by, by one of the rappers because I was close to close next, so continuously grinning. Because I was partly because I was really enjoying it, but then partly also because of the all all the stuff which was happening around me. Yeah. Um, and it was really funny being because he was wearing like a wedding dress which had been like sort of sprayed blue with a like a purple Batman logo being sprayed onto it. Cool. And he had like this neck brace. So it's, it's the first time I've ever been high fived by, by, by someone dressed in, in, a, in a wedding dress with like, <laughs> like. I like, you know. like the sound of that. I like the sound of the stage outfit, anyway. Yeah, well, I think the thing is, it does make me think of like sometimes how do you bring in like theatrics mm. to like to a show and how it makes, you know, how you can have like sometimes simple theatrics. Can make a show feel make it feel more emotional. Yeah, definitely. Like mm. I'm not really, you know, it's like it's it's, it's another element to think about, isn't it? Mm. We we have uh, like a lot of what we've done is like use visuals in our show, even since from the start. Like I just started like putting videos together that kind of went with the lyrics. Yeah. And then we'd bring like this old projector with us. And like try to project images that went with the songs, like just to give it like a different like you know dimension. Um, but it yeah, does. I've got a like I don't know what it's gonna be when we come back next time. It'll be like a new album and stuff like that. So I don't know what we'll do. It's like it's, it's a blank page at the moment. Yeah, and maybe but even that adds like a, like an element to it, where it's like it can be something really simple. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, like in a high tech or like kind of anything like that. In fact, sometimes, sometimes the more low tech it's been, the actual more brilliant, the more brilliant because of more like of an emotional context. Mm. Um, I mean, one of my favourites for very low fi visuals um, is Jeffrey Lewis. Oh yeah, brilliant! Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, I mean, like. But it's like going to one of his gigs is like a cross between entertainment and an educational lecture. Definitely. Yeah. Of like, especially when he does his comic books live. Yeah. And like the fact, the fact he turns up with like kind of with basically like a clipboard. And it depends on which stories he chooses to tell, because he'll either tell like the rise and fall of communism in like China or yeah. or like China, Russia, or then but then also he'll also either do like the story of the life of like one of his favorite car like one of his favorite comic artists or he'll do um like a random comic poem like random comic that he's done himself sort of thing yeah like yeah i, I was in a different band um, and supported him like years and years ago and like really opened my eyes to what like a live gig can actually be if you you know think yeah. of the box well so it's, it's also like kind of it's also the fact of like having, I mean, like, I guess the first time I would have seen him would have been around the time that he did the 12 Songs of Crass. Yeah, like it's the one crass. of my favorite albums of all time, that. Oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's one of the top 10 albums. Then, it's, then I think it's brilliant the way that he make, he that sometimes he will, he will make people look at a different genre in a completely different light. Yeah, I think he's, then, he's, done, he's done like 12 Songs of the Fall now, hasn't he, or something like that? Yeah. I haven't heard he's, that yet, but... He's also done. He's also done. Like started to go into Iron Maiden covers as well. Because <laughs> the, the last time I saw him, he played the Trooper, right? Live, and it was it was freaking brilliant. But it's yeah. like, because especially also the the tone that you get to have about beating up guitar. Yeah. It's like like a, it's it's kind of proof that you don't need expensive equipment to sound good. Sure. You know. You just you just want it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, but it's been like it kind of in that weird way. It kind of reminds me of like 
watching Richard Dawson. Yeah. So, you know, like, there, 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 there's definitely... Because Richard Dawson also plays in the very back of that beating guitar, does, which, yeah. is, which, which he's probably broken, like, three or four times. Yeah. But it's like, it, there's something beautiful, beautiful in the way that it looks kind of simplistic. Mm. Sort of thing. Yeah, there's definitely beauty and simplicity, isn't there? Um, I mean, that's sort of like, it's like as if in, sometimes you see guitar, like like certain band members, and they'll turn up with loads of effects units just to see someone like Richard Dawson turn up with maybe one, like, kind of, with one tuner and a massive fuzzy amp. And it's yeah. like, right, okay. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's honestly the loudest singer I've ever seen. Is he, yeah? Yeah, oh man, he projects. He wow. he really does project, but he also does lots of, he does lots of things which people wouldn't expect with acoustic guitar. Yeah. So he he'll- like the sound guy's dream, because not, not, no fancy set up and a yeah. loud voice and you're away, aren't you? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, he originates from like the Newcastle doom metal scene, right. and um, so he used to be in a band with like the guys from Pigs, Pigs, from Pigs Times Seven. Yeah. Because several of them are actually in his backing band. Oh wow. Um, but um, his his whole thing is that he kind of like writes in a way which is which kind of blends almost like sixteenth century style storytelling. In the modern day, yeah. So yeah. it's like, uh, so it's like you could write about even things like foot, like watching a football match, yeah. and it'd be like kind of like game of two halves sort of thing. Yeah, brilliant that song. Like, yeah, really, really funny as well. Like, oh man, he's 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 hilarious. I mean, but but it's also like, uh, is the only other person I've seen make pretty much an entire field at, at Green Man headbang to go with the acoustic guitar. Literally, because of like how, because of like, you watch him and he puts his entire physical body into the performance, okay. and he's just like going, Jesus Christ, if he played for much longer, he'd probably have a heart attack. <laughs> uh, I mean, need to see him. He's been scarily productive over lockdown because I think he did like 48 records. He was doing like an album a day. Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But then the thing is, they said, it's probably out of those songs, they probably like whittled them down to like 10 or 12 or something. Yeah. Well, it's, just, also, it's just something to do, isn't it? Set yourself a challenge and, mm. and do it. Well, so it's, I think it's, that's a good, like, kind of positive mentality to actually have is to go, like, right, okay, I'm going to set myself a challenge. So it's like every day I've got to do, achieve something. It is good, yeah. It is like, made me think I should do something like that. <laughs> just like, not like that, obviously, but just to some kind of challenge. Yeah. It's like, if, but it's like, it's like, it's like, um, like I've set myself a challenge of making my own podcast. Oh, yeah. Which I'm in the very final stages of putting together. So I've never actually made a podcast or radio show, really, yeah. myself. But I guess it's a bit like kind of, doing something like that and then looking at what you think is achievable. Yeah. What know, is, so what is, what is your podcast like? What's the premise of it? What's the... Uh... Uh, it's basically just me playing stuff which I really like because yeah. also we're going to turn probably some of these conversations into a podcast uh, yeah. potentially at some point. But it's basically me just like kind of going like, yeah, I come across this. Like the, the mainstream media don't really play any of this, or they don't, or like, um, basically, I see myself as very pretentious, like a John Peel type, <laughs> you know, kind of like going, like, This is really good. Um, yeah, again, most of it's like stuff which I've either discovered on festivals or my friends have put on the shows in Bristol, sort of thing, yeah. Um, so I mean, Sorry. yeah, I mean, I've just got to do like a little bit of smoothing up like if I'm like, recording myself speaking occasionally. Mm. I think the music side of it is all fully done and all really good, but the, but the, everything else is a bit ropey. Yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, it's my first time. Yeah. 
don't think people mind it a little bit of ropiness, do they? No, I don't think so, actually. I think I think it makes it more human, otherwise it just sounds too, too clean cut. Yeah. But also, like, I mean, also in terms of other things, it's the first time I've actually done an album cover artwork, is this year. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so, like, That's the Independent Venue Week compilation. So have yeah. you heard it? Have you... I don't think it's actually been... Is it, it's not come out yet, has it? No, it's coming out in a couple of weeks' time, I think. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, 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 I'm like finally, I've yeah. actually, you know, like what lifetime achievements tick is like do artwork for, for an album cover. Yeah. Really. It looks great, and like the album looks great. Like it's gonna be great as well. Yeah, your poem is brilliant as well. Not oh, nice, son. Yeah, no, I, re- I remember like kind of. Listening to it go, wow, yeah, it really actually really made me feel something. You know, yeah. like kind of it made me kind of like yearn for those connections again. You know, like we probably discussed earlier. Yeah. It's actually that it is always so much more than what we see in front of our faces. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, because I wrote it, like, wrote, it's obviously become a bit more like poignant this year because what's happened, but. Um, I wrote it for last last year's Independent Menu Week because we did a couple of gigs and just thought, I don't know, sometimes something just something just makes me think, well, I can write a poem about that, so I'll do yeah. it. So I just did that and then everyone on the gigs loved it. Um, probably like, probably got the biggest cheer of the night kind of thing. So Wow. Um, and everyone, because obviously independent venues are already like under threat as well. Mm. Because there's always like gentrification going on and they're always under threat because they're in a good part of town a lot of the time and you know property yeah. de- property developers want to make money so or sometimes like or sometimes, or sometimes it's like, like accidentally where they're positioned sort of thing yeah like the trades club in Hebden Bridge mm. I don't know if you ever played there yeah That's a, oh man it's a cracking venue isn't it yeah that's the only venue you've been to where you where you're allowed to buy fresh curry. Actually, in the venue where they actually do all the cooking in there. Oh yeah, I remember the food being really nice. Yeah. Last thing, so I did, so I did like a cow independent venue week tour this year, and mm-hmm. so I was lucky to, to go up to Heaven Bridge literally about two weeks before it flooded. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and. Yeah, I just remember just like being really taken with the whole place, really. I think mm. my favourite venues I visited were there, uh, the Brixton Windmill. Yeah. That's a great place. Uh, we did the first of the did the boiler room. I really, yeah. really, really liked the boiler room. Um, How big's the Brixton Windmill? It's about 100 capacity. All oh, right, okay. So it was, it was like really, really intimate. And yeah, we were watching Anna Calvi. Wow. And that was like, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, actually ended up kind of, so I ended up going on Steve Lamarck's show that afternoon as well, because he was doing a whole live broadcast. Yeah. And so I was there, um, so I've taken up, um, like, doing portraits of artists at shows. Mm. So no, no matter how lively the gig, uh, if I turn up with a bag, that means I've got a sketchbook. Yeah. And, and uh, um and so I managed to do sketches of both Steve Lamack whilst he's on air. Because like yeah. I was like, but well, okay, how can I kill time? Oh look, I've got a few, I've got a, I've got a few of my pens. <laughs> he, he won't notice anything. And and then um I also did like two of two pictures of Anna Calvi, so I did both of her sets. Yeah. Sort of thing. That's awesome. Yeah. And actually if I People do that at gigs and hand me a picture afterwards, and it's like, oh wow, that's amazing! You know, I've still got it. You know, obviously. Yeah. I mean, some of the, that. I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't throw away any of that stuff. It's like uh, in the walls of my flat, I've got um, it's like a mixture of like set lists and posters and stuff which I've had signed by artists, but then also like I've got um, fan mail from End of the Road Festival. Yeah. And like at a green mine, because they set up for a temporary um, 
like to the post office service. So people can write fan mail to their favourite art, art, favourite artist yeah. and people at the festival. That's really cool. Yeah, I know. It's just like, it's just that sentimental value. Even if a lot of the writing has been washed off, some of them, yeah. they've faded over time. But it's still like nice to be, good to be reminded of those. Yeah, it's a connection. Kind of yeah, and actually sometimes if you're feeling... Sometimes I find that it would help me that if I'm feeling a little bit down, they'd be like, right, okay, go and look at the wall. Yeah. Go and, you know, kind of remind yourself that even if you're feeling in a low space, that there are people out there that will love and support you. Mm. Really. Cool. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very blessed to have that, to be honest. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I remember coming back for the, the first time I went to the end of the road, which was like 2012, and I literally had like almost like a carrier bag full of letters. Amazing. Like, yeah. So they all, they all pretty much yeah, line my flat. Um, yeah, I mean, because I got inspired into doing, so I've to be mostly me talking, but I got inspired into doing um, portraits at shows. Mm -hmm. to a friend of mine called, he's a graphic novelist called Jock Winterhart. Okay. He's also a singer slash drummer in one of my favourite shambolic punk rock duos from, punk rock and roll duos from Bristol called Bucky. Cool. And um, yeah, he's an amazing dude, but he's, he's also like incredible because he's, he's like the only person I know who's born without a right hand. Wow. So it's like he's starting as a stump for like a right arm. Yeah. But um, he'd turn up at shows, and sometimes if he had this like a duffel bag with him, he'd out with pop like a little like a sketchbook, and he wouldn't just sketch the band, but he'd sketch all the audience. Oh yeah. He'd do everything in about ten seconds flat. Wow. He'd be watching him go like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> how the hell have you managed to you know like in a few in a few lines? Then he'd just be like handing out all the, all these pictures afterwards. He sounds awesome. Oh, he's amazing. He's, I mean, like I've been, I've been really lucky. So I've been, I, I, I worked with him on a couple of short, short animated films, which I've done, sort of thing. And um, I, I, the way I try to describe him, I know it's going to sound like slightly condescending in a weird way, but it's like kind of like the human version of caffeine. <laughs> if, you, if you ever needed positive motivation, yeah. he would, he would definitely be the positive buffering. Yeah. The amount of times I've been buffered into doing things because yeah. I'm hurt, because I'm hurt, going, come on, do it, do it, you 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 do it. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> we all need a few people like that, don't we? I think we do. I think that it's also like, I think sometimes we all need someone who'll give us like a loving kick up the ass sort of thing. Definitely. I think that sometimes my parents do that for me. Yeah. It's like whenever my ego gets too big. Like sometimes, yeah, I'll come down to my parents and they'll give me like the kind of loving pin in the whoopee cushion sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I get that. Well, I think it's just like you said, like the bed, yeah, the bed manager, <laughs> yeah, um, go on, um, my partner, um, we've been together like 11 years now, but she also does, she, she's also been doing the tour managing for the bands as well for like. The last few years as well so wow she she um you know gives me a, a slap or well, not literally but yeah tells me you know is that other person that you know points you in the right direction and everything yeah and i think sometimes we all need that right to be honest mm. i think that that's it's like the the importance of keeping grounded yeah and it's like also it makes you realize Sometimes in having those kind of like those groundings makes you realise, makes you take pride in actually what you do as well. Definitely. I think, and I think sometimes that, that, I mean, that's like kind of, I don't know if you, if you find that a stumbling block when it comes to like learning to be proud of your work and learning to let go of it. Yeah, I think once you've done it and you put it out in, out into the world, it's, it's kind of its own thing then, isn't it? Mm. Um, Think, I still think it's like, you know, bigging yourself up and stuff like that is still hard. 
it's all like you know you, st you still have to think imposter syndrome is is real like oh, yeah um certainly like accepting yourself as as an artist and someone who's got something good to put out there i think that you know the further you go on the the better it is but it's it's, it's not like the easiest thing in the world maybe you know some people it, it's not that way but i think especially I think... like everything i've done in the music industry has been like in my 30s as well so it, kind of, it was kind of like you don't really expect for that to happen when, when you yeah. kind of think it's a, it's a young person's game and i didn't really expect it to happen so Hmm. Um, but yeah, but I think that it goes to show that you know, good people will pick up on good art. I think they will, you know, like whether they find it, you know, like whether it takes them some time to find it, or mm -hmm. whether it takes, you know, like like it's like a lot of people, which I guess a lot of people which I can look up to are like people who are like slightly older than my generation, so mostly be people in the like the forties, fifties, or probably even older. Mm -hmm. And actually, some of them um, are still making some of the greatest art, like around. Like I, say, I mentioned, Richard Dawson, because like he's in his mid forties, and he's like he's only just found, really found his audience, like in the past five, six years. Yeah. And I think that it's important to tell people like the way to not to give up on their dreams. Yeah. I mean, maybe change, maybe change expectations, but like not to like kind of if there's something that they really want to achieve, so long as you don't hurt people. Yeah. You know, then you can do whatever you want to, really. Definitely. Like I was, like I, uh, we did a cover of a Malvina Reynolds song, um, "No Hole in My Head," like mm. ages ago. But like she was like really inspiring because she I think she started her career in the music industry in her 50s yeah and like wrote all these amazing songs started her own record label and did all this and it's like you know this seems to, it seems like life should be this perfect narrative and you you know what you're going to be and you just you know you get everything that you you're expecting but um you know there's the, the story is not always linear the story can mm. you know things can change at any time but it's like looking at, you know, like kind of like those Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings, for instance, and like kind of Charles Bradley and all the Dap Tone records. Mm. And some of them were for people who, I mean, Charles Bradley's story was, was quite phenomenal because he spent 20, 30 years being a James Brown impersonator, a like James Brown tribute singer. And literally, he was literally, he was actually, as the story is, he really was actually found in a bar as a James Brown tribute singer. Wow. And um, he released his first album of original material when he was like 62 years old. Oh, that's you know, and it's And it's a freaking amazing record as well. Yeah. I mean, I was I was lucky enough to, to have seen him play a few times because he was like, basically like, if you took James Brown's stage show and Al Green's voice and like mixed it together, it was like, yep, yeah, okay. It was like, no matter whether he was singing originals, whether he was singing other people's songs, he made it feel like his own. Brilliant. And, yeah, he, he always ended every single show by jumping down onto the barrier and hugging everyone. Aww. He, was, he was like, kind of, he was, he was a really sweet guy. I mean, he had a, he, I mean, like, he had a documentary made about him called Soul of America. Um, just because of, like his life, his first record basically details his life story. It was like, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. But I think the thing is, the thing is like, I mean, I look at stuff like even like Space Lady. I don't know if you've ever heard, ever heard her. No. Oh, she's amazing. Okay. I mean, like, she must be in her 60s. Yeah. And she was uh, like, a, like, maybe even 70s now, actually. I think, um, and she was a, a woman from New York who was a bus, who basically, she started out um, by doing busking performances on yeah. Casio keyboard. Yeah. All of her shows are basically her, on the, uh, uh, like her and her Casio. 
and it's like her doing like Casio versions of like the Beatles and like kind of yeah like Rolling Stones and um, a few other people and um, I think she got picked up by David Byrne in the end I think or like oh. there, there, there's something you know like a bigger artist basically picked up on her yeah and um, yeah she released an album like I think it's maybe like five years ago yeah sort of thing um it's pretty amazing it's, it's pretty amazing it's pretty bonkers to have their stuff because she like she performs with, like kind of like wearing like a satellite helmet <laughs> and her whole thing is that she's big because she came from like the whole 60s psychedelic era era yeah so her whole thing was like right okay i'm i'm someone from out of orbit i'm someone from the planet venus sort of thing love it Oh yeah, she was amazing. Um, I mean, I saw her. Must have been like maybe about two years ago in in the coastal hall. So uh, she's doing, she's like touring musician now. Yeah. Oh yeah, well she's been touring for a while. Yeah. But she's always been like, she's always been like what someone who's like attracted a very cult fan base. Yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. And then also like, but then sometimes I enjoy. Just, people's performances because of that yeah you know they're not trying to fit in with the with the like supposed normality sort of thing yeah i love that like you know it's just a different like narrative like and i love I, I do love these stories about people that have like found success at like different times and yeah. like when it wasn't expecting the crazy backstories and stuff like that yeah i mean like stuff like I mean, like, obviously, we love, I mean, obviously, most of the artists I could think of are probably more male than female, but um, but it's like um, like Gonzalez. Oh yeah. Sister uh, Gonzalez, because he was um, someone. His his story. They, they made the film Searching for Sugar Man about him. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's probably yeah. the best music documentary going. That isn't it? It's it's up there. Yeah. I, mean, I still think my favorite is The Devil and Daniel Johnson. Okay, I think and that, that that one was like, I mean, if you haven't seen it, it is amazing. But it was like, it, I mean, like that definitely, I definitely found that actually, the films and documentaries are a really good way to introduce people to music. Yeah. Um, because whether it's like having songs being used on soundtracks, or whether it's, um, you know, kind of like. Like seeing the stories of artists, so I came across Daniel Johnson through the Devil, and, the film The Devil on Daniel Johnson, mm. and I mean, it was like one of those sorts of things where I was like, right, I'm going to take a punt on this because mm. this looks interesting, and I went down to the watershed to go and see it, and just like came out several hours later, just like, wow, yeah, okay, I'd, I'd be like hit over the head because like. His story is is extraordinary. Well, was extraordinary because of all the stuff with. Um, well, he was he was he definitely had like sort of like mental health yeah. issues, but he's the only ever recording artist to sign, you know, a major recording deal whilst being whilst going to severe psychiatric treatment. Yeah. So whilst having electric shock therapy. Wow. And stuff like that. It's like, wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean like he was he was he was like one of Kurt Cobain's favourite artists. Yeah. And uh, Jeffy Lewis talks about him a lot as well, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that he did inspire like a whole wave of whether it's like kind of alternative indie or like kind of um especially like kind of I guess anti folk kind of artists. Yeah. Because of like he his whole thing was also that he didn't realise that people could reproduce records. So he, so his whole thing was like, hi, how are you? Was that he basically sat down and recorded each individual one. Oh. So like over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. He didn't realise that people could take a copy and duplicate it. Wow. You know, and that's, yeah. that is... You know, like kind of 
something very pure about his him, isn't there? Like yeah, the place where it's coming from is very pure and um, I don't know, like we were saying before, like simple and beautiful. It's like good art and bad art. Good art will always come from you'll always whether you fully understand the emotion, we'll always have an emotion behind it or context behind it. Yeah. But also made me realise, you know, like kind of, have you ever thought about doing like stuff for film soundtracks yourself? Um, not really, no, I haven't. Um, I haven't really you know, thought about that that much. Um, no one's ever approached me to do something like for a film or anything like that. So people have asked to use songs that have already, you know, have mm, already yeah. recorded, but I've not considered like actually making music for something. Yeah, it'd be, was... it'd be good to do it at some at some point, like. Yeah. Also, I think it'd be an interesting challenge. Would be mm. like taking your writing in a different way. Would be seeing if you thought about like you know, maybe writing a play of some sort. Yeah, or, like, or something, you know. I have thought about doing something like that, yeah. I keep so, on joining online courses to do like writing fiction or something, but I never actually end up like doing them all. I just like, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I think I'd like to do something, but maybe in person or something, you know, like doing a course or something, or yeah, or a, a group, a writer's group or something like that. I'd love to so, do something like that. Um, I think mean, I can see you. To are potentially doing that because of, I think it's like kind of, because I think it's great to have the musical side of it, but there's sometimes there's, there's other ways that you can, that you can combine like the music and mm. like the storytelling. Yeah. Because I've like this new album that I've been writing, I've been like, I've been, I've had like a loose idea in my head that it's like, it's, it's like something, because so, so, I think sometimes when you've got like, the whole the whole blank page when it's so big sometimes it's you don't know where to start kind of thing so I just like put a little plot in my head that it was like based in like a women's prison in the future <laughs> and you can't you can't really tell now when you listen to the song you listen to the songs or the words and stuff but it was like it was like a little like loose idea that was in my head mm. and you know something like that you could develop that into like an actual yeah, and have like the music that does go with it. I definitely think that 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 really works because I've seen like people like Kate, well, like, like well, Kate Tempest, as they used to be known as, or Kate Kate Tempest. Yeah. Now know. Oh yeah. Um, just because I've seen her, I've seen her work, and I've seen how she can blend, you know, like the the words of storytelling and music together. Yeah. I think that's definitely like it's. That's definitely something which is definitely achievable. Yeah. But I do understand as if when you do come to things from the blank page, you just go, well, okay, I've got this big, uh, you know, like unmovable object, but it's like, how do you break it down into smaller chunks? Yeah. Sometimes you're uh, giving yourself barriers where it um, makes it, you know, brings out creativity more because you've got like something to work within. Yeah. So, but like, because one of the other things which I've got to do when we're supposedly out of lockdown, I mean, like, they're probably out of lockdown, um, is I've got to make a stop motion animation musical. Wow. I know that's a bit of a trick, but, but, but it's like, it's going to be like about a 25 minute long short film. That's but really like a lot of stop motion, isn't it? Yeah. But it's, but, but it's um, so it's me working with, with Joff again, who's like one of my favourite human beings on the planet Earth. So, yeah. Um, but because um, all the films which we've done are, are like kind of based on my life, because I think that they're they're like the nearest. If you're going to get an emotional reaction, they're the things which you could base them on. Yeah. And so, um, basically, it's loosely based on me, but it's like kind of like dealing with grief and dealing with like kind of like grieving process sort of thing. Okay. Um, and they're very kind of complex living situation which I found myself in sort of thing. Yeah. And so yeah, I mean like which is which is also the stuff which I used for my raps as well. Would yeah. be like right okay talking about like high intense emotions sort of things. Yeah. 
But yeah. That sounds really good. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like kind of, I think, you know, like in the past five years, I've found myself, you know, like, kind of like doing things that I never ever thought I'd end up doing, to be honest. Yeah. Never thought I'd go into filmmaking, never thought I'd be able to help have conversation series of like this. Yeah. Never thought, um, like, I'm, so I'm with a group called Art in Motion, who are like a special needs arts group. Yeah. And, um, through them I've done stuff like um I've had like artwork being being shown over an island, I've had like kind of you know, sort of like ridiculous kind of ego blowing up sort of stuff. <laughs> so I've had to like kind of like bite my lip go, yeah, this is definitely gonna go on the surreal moment. <laughs> like kind of like going up to Edinburgh Film Festival and having one of the most awkward, brilliant but awkward even evenings just because I was surrounded by so so many like successful film people. Yeah. I was like, and I remember being in like a late night bar and be like, oh look, there's like Toby Jones, Stanley Tucci, um, Kevin Bacon. Yeah. Um, oh my God. You know, like kind of a almost like A-list actors sort of things and like actresses. And yeah. I felt like, I'm going to be really, really awkward because I'm, like, I'm, I'm awkward around some people anyway. <laughs> so I was like, right, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to go and slightly danced by the by the by the DJs because they're playing lots of really good 80s music. So like they're playing lots of talking heads and the ver. And I looked up and it's like, hang on, that's Matthew Johnson from the ver. <laughs> we literally sat at a table opposite. Wow. Yeah. Some of these like when good things happen you just gotta kinda go, it's not so bad, is it? <laughs> yeah. But then sometimes it's like it's different you do have to pinch yourself and go like, that's definitely a pinch me moment. Yeah. You know, and I think that it, it still revolves around being grounded or trying to be as grounded as possible. Yeah. I guess it's like with both of us having these things happen to us in our 30s when we, you know, like can live through our 20s and so it's like we could take things with a bit more of like a kind of like a pinch of reality, maybe. Definitely. Yeah. And, and they still have some moments where they're like, Holy fuck, I'm in the same person as this person. Or, um, yeah. Like, kind of, um, like the amount of times which I've accidentally weirded out people, like Tim Burgess, for instance. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, was, it was actually the first time I, the first time I kind of met him, I didn't actually realise it was him. Yeah. Well, I didn't actually meet. Um, he was roadieing for his partner's band, uh, Factory Floor, okay. uh, who I really, really like. And I was watching them play at a festival in Bristol and I used to get so like they're like completely freaking out that I basically kind of pretty much end up on the floor, like almost rolling <laughs> in between from speed, so you know, like kind of like like doing the worm sort of thing. <laughs> and um so Tim Burgess was there. He was but he was like trying to be there completely incognito. But <laughs> apart from the fact that I kept to see this guy. So he's like wearing, you know, kind of like tracksuit top, you know, like sort of scruffy jeans, you know, and he had his blonde mop, but like cap on and like spectacles. Yeah. Just kept on every now and again staring at me really intensely. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's like, okay, he's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> this is really strange. <laughs> and like, kind of like, I just remember like continuing on. It's only the fact that I saw him play a solo show a few months afterwards and he said, Oh, yeah, by the way, I met you at, at, at Simple Things. Yeah. I, 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 was, <laughs> I was just like, Okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's slightly surreal when you do have those moments. <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've been lucky to also like experience some, some of the very best and some of the worst and the very, very, very worst in music. Mm. What do you reckon is the worst thing you've ever seen? The worst thing I've ever seen? Um, or do you have any like people that you've played with that were particularly bad? I'm sure I do. I'm going to forget. I'm going oh, well, to... I've had some, some mad experiences, like my own experience being on stage one time. Um, I didn't realise that I'd, I'd eaten some, I'd eaten a bit of corn and I'm oh, actually okay. very allergic to corn, 
which I've realised ah. over the last few years. Ah. Um, so we did. We were playing in Leeds, um, in a nice, really nice room. Probably don't know about four hundred, five hundred people or something. And then wow. I realised when we were doing line check that I was I was sick. So I was, I was throwing up and then going out to do the line check. It was a forty-five minute set and managed to make it like half. I managed to make it to half an hour and then I just had to, I just had to mic drop and walk off and just yeah. go and throw up. So everyone was like, and the band was still playing. They were like, what is she, what is she, yeah. what is she doing? So that's yeah. one of the, that's one of my worst experiences. Wow, I think I think like you know like kind of you know how we talk about sometimes people having you know kind of other creative careers. I think two of the worst things I ever saw. One was Macaulay Culkin's Peter Underground. <laughs> the Peter theme, to, you know, like kind of Velvet Underground tribute featuring Macaulay Culkin. Wow. Yeah, from Home Alone. Yes. <clears throat> him. And like, it's basically him and his stoned friends singing and bashing like Peter Box lids, you know, like kind of, <laughs> um, whilst doing the, the worst. Um, Velvet Underground themed pizza themed puns you could think of. <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was actually kind of quite funny, but it was like kind of yeah, it was awful. But um, possibly even worse than that, and even more surreal than that, I went to Bristol Pride one year. Well, I've been to Bristol Pride for a few years, but um, they had um, all of a sudden they had Jack Johnson turn up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like the friend, the 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 Californian singer. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, he was awful. <laughs> he he was he, he was like well the thing about him is that I think he'd been up on an all nighter with like one of his friends mm. uh, the night before because I'm like um, he didn't just necessarily not play in tune. He didn't play. He, he also didn't play any recognisable songs. <laughs> so they they were like kind of playing a different. He, he was completely out of time with his ukulele player. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it, the thing is, it's, you've got to be really bad not to get a round of applause at, at, at Pride. Yeah. You know, because they're, they're, they're probably one of the most sympathetic audiences. Yeah. But he was so bad that he managed to clear the entire field. Oh my it was God. like watching Tumbleweed. <laughs> like, is it? Yeah, it was like, it was like, watching, it was like watching Tumbleweed blowing across the path. Wow. I was um, like, I, I was like, wow. It's like, no, not many people will actually remember being there, but I definitely was. That's brilliant. And I think he lasted for about 10 minutes. Yeah. But it was but like... I can't think of anything like bad that I've seen right now. I don't know, I've just had a mind blank. But... I think sometimes it depends on what you value as being good or bad. Yeah. You know, it's like, I've seen people be technically good. Sometimes you want something so bad that it's good. Yeah. <laughs> I know, like, like my obsession with certain songs. Because <laughs> I've also been hammering the new Kylie record. Oh, yeah. In Italy. Yeah, I'm a sucker for a bit of pop music. Yeah, I like a bit of pop. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not that into Kylie. But, but no, I mean, I'm not massively into her, but, the, but her new record is actually really, really good. Okay. It's actually like, I think she's definitely taken nods from like, Christine and the Queens sort yeah. of thing, where as if it's just gone back and gone like, hang on, let's do, read these GD54. And it's, yeah. so it literally does sound like and like stuff like Grace Jones, Nile Rogers, there's yeah. a bit of like kind of St. Vincent D kind of like influences in there sort of thing. Yeah. It's even good, good disco pop sort of thing. Yeah. Christine and the Queens is great. Yeah, yeah man. I think she's, I think the thing is that she, She's had such a huge impact on on music and culture, really. Mm. If you think about it, like she's definitely like I've noticed in like in the past maybe year or so that like how pop music's got a lot more analog sounding again. You know, like so like using synthesizers and stuff like that instead of using um I guess like like compre like instead of compressing the hell out of things sort of thing. Yeah. Instead of using the stuff that's on the computer kind of thing, using actual analog synths and stuff like that. Yeah, always got that kind of that feel to it again. 
You can imagine like people actually being in the studio together, sort of thing. Whereas, like quite often, I think with a lot of the Britney Spearsy type pop, you could tell that it was all done by machine. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, let's face it, we're all suckers for pop music. Yeah. Everyone. I yeah. mean, like, I love your cover of Overload. Oh, nice one. I mean, that, I mean that, that's a great song. Like, yeah. I think that actually that sometimes in music snobbery, what gets overlooked is actually how great some of the songwriting is. Yeah, definitely. That's just a great song, that great pop song. Yeah. Like, when, yeah, I mean, when the song's really great, it kind of becomes pop, doesn't it, as well? Yeah, it does. And it's like, you know, whether you're looking at stuff like the Human League, because when, like, stuff like the Human League, when they originally came out, they were, like, really cutting edge and really daring, whereas now it would be seen as really mainstream. Yeah. Sort of thing. And the fact that, uh, that mainstream artists also did adapt, adopt their sound sort of thing. Yeah. Even when you're looking at stuff like Bowie, for instance, who would who would like kind of go like, what's new, what's next, or like, even someone like uh, like a Madonna, for instance. Yeah, I love Madonna. Yeah, uh, I think that. Yeah, I think my if I was to say that my favorite probably pop musician is probably Grace Jones. Yeah. Oh man, have you ever seen Grace live? No. Oh, it's bonkers. I've got something to do, you know, you'll probably like this then. Oh, what's that? Is that free food? I don't have to watch. Show you this. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Your friend got it me for my birthday. <laughs> oh, man. That, that, that's a great print as well. Cool, isn't it? It's a, well, I think it's that she she had got such a striking presence as well. Yeah. I mean, Basically, but, sometimes you just say to each other, "What would Grace say, or what would Grace do?" You know, when yeah. you want, you know when you want to get that like fire in you, and you're like, "Give no." I mean, you, you want, get get if you do get a chance to see her live, she is absolutely incredible. Okay. But it is like also batshit crazy. Yeah. It is like kind of. Um, it's like every single song is like costume change. Um, she'll do all like the all the audience like interaction backstage. Okay. While she's getting dressed into an even more ridiculous costume. Okay. And it's like, um, I mean, I saw her maybe two or three times about a couple of years ago. Yeah. Just because of um, she was at Primavera Sound and she also headlined um, Stan and Cooling Festival. Okay. And, uh, and she was she had like the biggest rider that it ever had to deal with. I think it did oh, got that. Oh, oh yeah. man, her ride is about twenty five grand. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. It's it's like, but then again, to be honest, it's like you're paying for the artist. You're paying. You that's what you got to pay to get someone like Grace Jones. Yeah. I mean, like she she had like five bottles of Bullinger, so it's served in like kind of metallic ice crates. Oh like, but it's also the fact that. Like her brother does all the all the designs for the costumes and stuff. Yeah. I mean, like you see her like she'll do like a thirteen minute version of like Slave to the Rhythm, and be hula hooping throughout the entire show, throughout the entire song, and not miss a single beat. And and she always does the whole thing of like kind of going onto like one of the security guard's shoulders and going out into the audience and like kind of, um, it's it's. It's also just like the hilarious things that she says in between the songs. Yeah. To be honest with you. I mean, she introduced like one of the new songs that's standing cooling by saying that she thought it sounded a bit Irish. But really? <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, what? What? What, what, what part's <laughs> Irish, Grace? <laughs> oh, that. You know. Like, but, but it's also the fact that like, during one of the songs, she literally turn herself into like a gutter pool. Where she was like kind of helmet, she had like a kind of like an infrared laser, which she had literally pointed at her head. Hmm. It was like, wow, okay. <laughs> it's like you're gonna get a ridiculous pop show. I suppose if you, I suppose you know, if you're if you're in that zone and you can be ridiculous, why not? Yeah. 
And, then, and I mean, like, because I think the first time I would have seen her would have been Festival, maybe 2008, I think. And I just remember her coming on with even more and more ridiculous headgear in between every single song. It was just like the taller, basically, she was like, she was getting taller. Yeah. But it's also like, possibly like the most amount of, well, some of the most amount of nudity from like that, that I've seen from like a pop show has yeah. probably been Grace Jones. Because she, she, like, because she literally does virtually wear nothing. Most of the costume was body paint. Wow. It was just like, why are you watching her? Grace, you're 70 something years old. Amazing. It's it's phenomenal. Amazing. But anyway, yeah. Louise. You know, people always say, like, if you could work with any artist, who would it be? You'd want yeah. to pick someone like, like, I'd want to pick someone like Grace or like, or Yoko or something, you know, someone, someone you're going to come out with something weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Weird. I think, I think with Yoko, you're definitely on for, definitely on for this. Although, to be honest, she, she's had her moments of pop genius sort of thing. Yeah. Come on, Walking on Thin Ice is a freaking amazing song. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, and like, kind of, I mean, if I was to work, say, to work, I was wanting to work with certain favourite artists. Yeah. And someone like Annie Lennox would be, like, it's, it's, she's on my, like, right, okay, if she ever plays live again, then, I've, then she's someone on my I have to see list. Yeah. Just because, yeah. like, she's out, uh, just because, like my mum used to play her music a lot and, and like car journey sort of thing. I keep so, listening to Love as a Stranger and being like, that's like, that's gotta be one of the best tunes ever, ever written. For me, it's Walking on Broken Glass. Yeah. Just that, that, that bit like soundtrack my 10 year old tell. Yeah. You know, like, and so like if, if I was to do like, a, like maybe a random cover of a pop song, I probably would try and do that song. Yeah. But like a kind of, Maybe alt rock or metal style. Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, um, my mum's just butting in. <laughs> I've got to take the dog for a walk in a minute. Okay. That's the one that's one of the great things of actually being down here is actually having the dog. Yeah. It means that sometimes if I'm really if I'm really like slightly pressured or down, I can just escape the dog for an hour or so. Yeah. I mean, it, is, it does make a difference taking the dog out for a walk. Like, it's great. Well, it's actually, it gives you incentive to leave the four walls. Yeah. And actually, maybe gets you to see the world in a different in a different way as well, sometimes. Yeah. And a bit of nature. Yeah. yeah oh, you need a bit of nature. Yeah. Apart from she's like, kind of, well, she's te temporarily banned from, like, from a, from a nature park near us because she's gotten into chasing deer. <laughs> And um, well, yeah, she's got and it's and it's rutting season, so the deer are ultra smelly. And oh, because yeah. like she's got the scent in the nostrils, then she then of course as soon as she smells it, she's gonna go deer and yeah. literally run. Yeah. Be it. He's like always if we ever go anywhere where there's sheep, he's like thinks he's a sheep dog all of a sudden and trying to herd them all somewhere. Or something. So, we used to have a dog where but she also used to round up cattle. <laughs> <laughs> Who he was afraid of sheep, because like I think that that, that he's like a rescue dog that would be trying to shove him in uh, like a sheep pen with a pregnant ewe, and he basically got like kind of rammed out of it within about twenty seconds. Yeah. Um, and so, but but for some reason he ended up ram he would always round up cattle. <laughs> it was slightly terrifying because you see all these cows running everywhere and the dog like kind of yeah. trying to herd them. Yeah, he's running after the sheep and like we're running after him trying to get him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Penny Hill or something. Yeah, literally does send into like a like a cartoon sketch really, doesn't it? Yeah. Well anyway, I've got to go and take the dog for a walk. Okay. But lovely to see you, Louisa. Chat. Thanks so much, bud. Bye. -bye. That, was, that was lovely.